I have eight random questions here and you have to pick three numbers and then whatever question they correspond to, that is where we begin. Okay. So what is your first number of eight? Seven. My favorite question, because this is one of my favorite movies, it's called Scream. And there's only one question that can be asked for a topic that is Scream. What is your favorite scary movie? Oh, great question. Oh my gosh. You know what the first thing that comes to mind? It, it, it's uh, Let the Right One In, the, um, the, the, the original, uh, because it was so inventive and, and like I felt kind of sorry for everyone in it, although it's like intense and you, you kind of shouldn't because they're vampires. But yeah, I just thought it was like, had that brilliant thing of kind of horror genre, but also like psychological thriller at the same time. Your second number now. Number three. Number three is Never Again. What is something you did for a role that now makes you say, I am really glad that I tried that once, but I will never do that again? Oh my gosh. Oh God, it's really hard to, oh, it's really hard. Um, network television. <laughs> oh, we will get to that. <laughs> only, uh, only because like the, there's so many voices in it, it gets diluted down and I feel like it becomes a bit like massed. I, I don't mean to like, cause I watch network TV and I love it, but my, my experience of doing it was like churning out stuff really quickly. And I think like, I'm so, I'm such a sort of like reflective when it comes to work and characters. I really love the time it takes to actually get involved in the character in the world rather than like churning out 15 pages of dialogue a day and exposition. Exposition I would say is the hardest thing to do as an actor, because it's you're just delivering plot lines. You have one last uh, number to pick here. What is your final one? I'm gonna go with number one. Here's my, my one Mission Impossible one on the list. I'm calling it a uh, travel buddy. So when you go on a big trip, like what you're on right now, you wanna have really good company. You want some good travel buddies around you. And in particular, I wanna know what it's like going on a trip like this with Tom Cruise. What is one thing about him that makes him a good travel buddy? But then I also wanna know something about yourself that you think makes you a good travel buddy. Oh, okay. So I think with Tom, he's just got this insatiable amount of energy and it's it's always present. He's always there to completely serve the, the fans and serve the movie. So you, you just know with him on board, that kind of leadership and that mentor, that everything everything is kind of geared for you to have a really positive experience. And I love that because you know, you're traveling the world and there's a lot of logistics and there's time zones to contend with. And he's such a sort of an advocate for taking care of yourself and pacing yourself, but also finding a fun, you know, a lot of fun in it. So yeah, without a doubt, that's for him. Okay, so what I what makes me a good travel buddy? Oh, I'm really good at recommending a podcast or a movie or a book. Um, so I'm, you know, anything that I'm excited about, I'm I'm, I'm happy to share with my traveling companions. Um, so I'll, you know, I, that would be sort of my contribution, I think. Okay, there's only one follow up question to that because I have a flight to LA coming up. What what is a, a podcast, book, movie, anything type of recommendation you would give? One, right? I was really late to this, uh, but so you might have heard it already. But I, I was on a road trip and I listened to the true crime podcast West Cork. Ooh, I have not listened to that. Oh, good. Oh my gosh. I was like, you know, one of those things where you just want to, you're like, oh my God, let's, do I have enough time on this road trip to get through another episode of it? And it's that kind of thing. It sort of like takes over your world. It's, it's so well done, like really smart journalism. What's up, everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night with someone I am thrilled to have on the show, Haley Atwell for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. First off, huge congratulations and thank you for being here. I'm a big fan of a lot of your work and happy to cover as much of it as we possibly can today. Wow, what a, what a privilege. Thank you. It's so good to be here. So you are inspired to become an actor. At the time, what did you think step one to becoming a professional actor was? And now looking back, is that a first step you would actually recommend to an aspiring actor? Or did you find something that was more effective along the way? I was fortunate enough to, when I was uh, 16, we had in England, we had this, well, I did at, at, at the time, think work experience where you go out for two weeks when you're 16 and you do an unpaid job in a, an office or somewhere in the kind of an, in the industry that you've told your teachers you're interested in. And I'd said, you know, acting. And so I got a, 
um, this job for two weeks working as a casting director's assistant. And what was amazing about it is that I would sit there with a script and actors would come in and audition. And then when they left, I would audition with them. So I got to practice doing scenes with actual professional actors. I was like, this is amazing. It was terrifying, but really, really useful. And then when they would leave, I would hear what the producer, the director, the casting director, what their feedback on it was. And what was so kind of surprising to me is you'd, you'd have someone come in who was amazing, who I felt like comparatively speaking, I was like, oh, they've definitely got the job. And then it would be something as arbitrary as, yeah, but I don't know if they match the person we've cast in this role next to them, or maybe we need someone that's a bit older or, and the conversation was rarely about the, how good the audition was in a way, because there was a sort of an understanding that anyone coming in was probably gonna be really good. Um, and it just gave me that sense of going, oh, if I go out later on and do an audition and I don't get it, it was like, it's like standing at a platform and the train goes by and you go, oh, it wasn't my train. So that was put me in good stead to understand kind of how to take rejection with humility and with like a sense of ease. And my, the casting director at the time, he'd said to me, you know, if you want to be an actor after experiencing what it's like to see all these headshots coming into my office every day, if you still know that you want to do it and you know how kind of precarious the business is, then then go to drama school and start learning your craft and commit yourself to it. So I think, think the next part of my answer would be the advice that I would give to anyone is get out of your own way as, to, as opposed to being self-reflective about what you feel you want to do and how you want to feel and express yourself and think about how can I develop a skill set and a craft that either entertains, provokes, inspires, moves, um, delights an audience. And drama school particularly the you know the classic drama schools like in London and I know New York has some incredible ones too give you that foundation of a classical training where you're understanding language but you're also understanding how to use your voice and stage technique and how to um, tell a tell a story live in front of an audience it's kind of if you're attuned to it it's going to give you feedback about how much you've got them um, and so, yeah, th those two things. And I, I'm so, so, so pleased that I did that because it just gave me a foundation. I wanted to go back to college and ask one because I love asking this because sometimes studying a craft like acting in school is the right path for some and not for others. What was it that made you think you needed to get a degree in acting? And then I'm now I'm making this convoluted, but also what is something you learned in that program that you still find yourself using to this day? But on the other hand, what is something that all the schooling in the world never could have prepared you for when you hit your first set? Three, a great three part <laughs> question. So first part of your question um, was about, remind me again. What, what made you want to pursue a degree in oh. acting rather than just jump into professional acting gigs? For, well, I mean, from a, like a very practical point of view, I had no contacts in the industry and I was a shy kid and I was like bookish and nerdy and into philosophy. And I, would start, I had started a degree in philosophy and theology at King's College in London. And I, as soon as I got there, I thought, I really like the subject, but this is three years of my life. And if I know that I wanna pursue acting after this, this doesn't seem like the best use of my time or the or the kind of, it feels a bit like my place here is, I'm wasting, I'm, I'm the, the part, the, the, the position to study this is being wasted on me when other people should, maybe should be coming in who'd actually use that degree. So I, I left early. And that's when I started again, working as a casting director's assistant and doing advert auditions. And it was it was the casting director I worked with, a guy called Jeremy Zimmerman, who said to me, I want you to come to the showcase of RADA and Guildhall and Central and Lambda, and I want you to see great students acting. And so I went to the showcase and it's when all agents are invited to see the final year of the, you know, people do monologues and duologues. And especially Rada, I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is amazing. These like 18 to 25 year olds, some were older than that, having done a degree where you, the, their presence, their command of their voice, of their language, I was in awe of it. And I thought, I, I, want, I want to know how to do that. And I don't currently know how. And I know that if I go to drama school at the end of that degree, it's not about the piece of paper, the degree, it's going, agents are gonna come and see me. And so that's gonna naturally launch the step of actually having a career. So that was the first part of your question. What I learned while I was there, it's a safe space where you try lots of different things. You know, 
I'm playing an 80 year old. I was like 20 at the time and I'm playing a tree or I'm playing, you know, the color blue. Um, we did elements once and I was like fire for an afternoon. And that, you know, they, they seem to be the, the things that we like to mock drama schools for, but what you're doing is you're getting, you're, you're developing an understanding of your body as an, as an instrument and learning how to have the neutral actor's body, whereby after that you can adopt certain different sort of uh, physicality or different centers of gravity and different gestures that will convey a sort of through line of what who your character is for the audience. And I was also studying Shakespeare, so beating out the iambic pentameter and hearing rhythms of speech, and then reading lots of classical plays and going, what makes this a classic? What, why, what are the themes in this that feel universal, that transcend its time? And then you're also, you've got scene partners for three years where you're developing this trust as an ensemble, where you're, you're working out where your limitations are, but also you're learning from each other. So it's a really, um, it's, it's really expansive, you know, definitely not comfortable, definitely not easy. And, you know, that's why I made as many mistakes as I possibly could and got as painful feedback as I as, as anyone could have about certain things. Maybe my, the color blue wasn't convincing. Um, but it set me in good stead because I think now what I've taken from that course is a deep, deep rooted, unshakable work ethic, which is I'm here to serve the text or to serve the story. Um, this isn't about reducing the part to being me. So I have a moment where I can feel something. It's me working towards something outside of myself for in, in a place of service to the, or the custodian of that character that you're portraying. Um, and I think, you know, that, that puts you in as an actor in such good stead when if you're lucky enough to get you know, work consistently and, and the natural byproduct of that is your public persona grows or your, you know, the presence becomes a little bit more public. How to navigate that side thing, which is this thing called fame or this thing called celebrity culture, which never never interested me because it was it was an abstract and quite a toxic thing. It was like a weird popularity contest, which made me go like, I, I felt like I'd left the playground when I was you know when I left school, but here we are. And it did, and and I also thought what it what it does to the actors is it erodes their creativity because they become focused on themselves and how they're, you know, there is a, the, that line between who they are as people in private and who they are as contributing artists to the healthy civilization. Um, it gets blurred. Uh, but I think if you know what your craft is, then that becomes much more distinct and you can compartmentalize. I do want to lean into Agent Carter and kind of go back to what you were you were saying while we were playing dicey questions here, because, you know, I'm, I'm willing to bet the cancellation of a show like that is disappointing. But in this industry, the ups and and downs do come with valuable learning curves. So what are some, you know, takeaways that maybe influenced how you picked projects going forward based on how that show and its end was handled? Yeah, well, it, it's, a, it's a strange one because I think it took me kind of quite a number of years to work out why it had been canceled given its critical acclaim. And it's still ongoing critical acclaim. When I often see it, they, my friends will people text me and say like, she's like, your show is number one when they ranked it of Marvel shows. And I'm, and I've had loads of people on social media going, why aren't you doing more? And I'm like, ask Marvel. I don't know. I think it's also to do again, I suppose my, my conversation earlier about network television, um, uh, that, that it's also, there's so many sort of moving parts to the business side of something that you're not as an actor in control of. And there's like polit background politics. And I think, you know, Marvel film had split from Marvel TV and I had come from Marvel film. And so I got kind of caught in the crossfire of that. And our show wasn't really publicized. It was kind of the slot was at an odd time. It was limited compared to the other longer shows. So there's all these things that weren't in my control. And really when I was doing the show, I was not really thinking about them. I think now I would be much more um, engaged in the business side of it so that I feel like I could protect the show that I was in um, and advocate for it and really question the quality of the writing at times or questioning where the marketing was going and um, and how visible it could be. But back then, you know, I was just kind of just play her and have an amazing time with this ensemble. Um, so that's, I think, for sure, I've learned, I've learned about that. 
It's been really interesting having conversations with a lot of actors who become producers, because on the one hand, you don't want to feel the need to become a producer just to protect the project you're working on. But then on the other hand, I get very excited when I hear about actors I admire wearing multiple hats to make sure that thing is brought to screen in the best possible way. Yeah, totally. What's why you know Tom Cruise is such an inspiration because he's a one man studio. He does the man does it all because he's invested in every element of of it from conception to script to lighting to costume design to hair and makeup to the stunt work to the training program that goes into it to then the marketing of it afterwards. You know, he's and I'm like, oh yeah, it, it's almost seeing him has given me permission to go. If you if if I'm if I can see things that are going on and I have I can have input in other ways speak out, you know, for the for the sake of the, the story being well served, rather than just my role in it. And that is that takes a bit of time and experience to be able to start going, okay, I know I can do my job, that's done. So where else can I grow from this? And how how much more of a kind of producerial hat can I put on? Mission Impossible, full force now. So I was watching the interview you did with my colleague, Steve, at the premiere, and you had mentioned that when you first signed on for the film, you weren't given a a specific well-defined character per se, but rather through your collaboration with that team, you were going to find the character, the character was going to emerge. So it made me wonder, during that process, do you remember the specific thing that happened or the idea that came up that put her into focus the most for you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think a couple of things. Chris McQuarrie had seen me in the, in the play The Pride at Trafalgar Studios in London 10 years ago. And I met him afterwards and he'd said, he said there was a moment in the play that he went, that thing that she does that she can access, I, I want it. I want to, I want it in a movie. I just don't know in what capacity. And and I'm, he said that to me quite early on when, when I got the role, he was like, you know, I've been, you know, we want to been trying to find this moment for six years now. It's now been obviously 10 years because the film took four years to make. Um, and I, and I remember that moment was, um, was like a, is a moment of vulnerability for the character in the play that's really held in this very silent moment. And it's, it's, it's really beautiful. And Jamie Lloyd kind of would create this space where he'd go every night, dare yourself to hold on to that emotion without saying anything and like let the audience in that silence just have that experience of that, what that character's internal world is. So I'd sort of bravely every night try and extend that pause, but not so much that it became like indulgent or people getting like, come on. And, and it was a timing that I just, I could fa- find throughout the run created the most, the biggest impact. And so f- for McHugh, I think there was, it was quite into, tr- into filming where my character Grace is quite a vulnerable moment. And, and I, and I think it was kind of in instinctively, I just, I started becoming much more engaged with the cost of what Grace had been through but also the cost of what it is to be hyper vigilant and hyper independent in the world. And I found like her wound and what that wound is, is if we are as human beings, our survival is dependent on connection and attachment to our primary caregivers, then to our family, our friends, our society, our tribe, then the person who is running away from any possibility of connection because they don't trust other human beings is coming from a place of survival that's be very lonely and quite painful to exist in. And so for me that discovering that grace, grace is in a conflict was the thing that she and any human being wants the most in the world, which is friendship and kinship is the thing that she's also most scared of, therefore won't allow herself to feel it or trust it. it creates this like emotional impact. And that to me was like, oh, that's the heart of her. And then I was able to sort of work backwards and all the fun stuff and all the levity and the action stuff was sort of on the surface, but then underneath there was something more psychologically astute at play going on. And that's when I felt like, okay, I think I know who Grace is. I have to talk about the the handcuff driving scene because that is one of many incredible set pieces in this movie. Two, two about the driving. One, I I heard you say somewhere that your level of being able to drive competently increase. So what is something you learned while making the movie that is actually influencing your everyday driving, but then also that you study drifting? So what is something that surprised you in terms of what it takes to drift a car? 
So I, I was, I trained for five months with Wade Eastwood on a racetrack here in the UK and I would train with him and then I'd go into the studio and do the fight stuff and, uh, you know, knife work and sleight of hand tricks. And Tom and McHugh would be overseeing all of that. So they'd be checking in on me. They would be making sure I was you know, comfortable and I was enjoying it. And I got every, like all the support I needed to sustain that level of kind of athleticism. And then, so the, I am now, I feel, I feel like I'm a good driver. My friends and family think I'm quite erratic. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I'm perfectly in control. They're like, yeah, but you're not in an action film now. We're just going to the shops. Like, can you just slow down? I'm like, yeah, but I'm within the speed limit. It goes, yeah, but you're sort of going from naught to 25 or 35 really, really fast. I'm like, well, it's I, okay. So I'm not, you know, I wouldn't say I was the best driver because of that, but in, a, in an emergency situation, I could get a pregnant woman to the hospital in time, I think. I could dodge. Um, and then the drifting was, you know, that 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 came out quite quickly. You know, Wade Eastwood is always looking to see where my natural abilities lay and therefore going, okay, you, like, Pom Klementiev is amazing at high, high kicks. And so, and she'd, have, and she'd been studying martial arts for many, many years. So that, she, it became a very specific sort of stylized fighting skill she was brilliant at. For me, drifting came really quickly. And uh, Wade was like, we're gonna use this. So anything that was kind of, that I was getting to kind of a high level of competency in, in they were like, okay, you, we'll use that in the movie. And so I remember kind of early on being in the car and uh, had, had just, just worked out the knack of drifting. And Tom came out of nowhere in a helicopter and like flew down unexpected. And I looked at the kind of the wing mirror and Wade was like, oh yeah, yeah, he, he, he just wants, he's just coming to say hi, like play with him. Like he'll follow you and you follow the car. And I'm going, oh my God. And he's like piloting the helicopter going like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, this is intense. But I felt so safe doing it. And I think what, what working with those guys taught me is that you can perform recklessness but be very in control of what you're doing. And I would need that. So by the time that we got to Rome, where the, these obstacles of actually, you know, people around old buildings, there's higher stakes, these are real stunts, that we could do it. Uh, we could have a, 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 a freedom to our performance. We could try lots of different things because we had the, the foundation of that discipline down. And that took, that's the laborious task of just drills and what we call getting enough seat time in. And, you know, be times when I come back, back from the racetrack or from like a stunts fight and I'd be so frustrated because I was like, I wanted to learn it and get it quicker than I was actually getting it. And that all of that just takes time for your body to adjust and to have the muscle memory working. That is like true movie magic, that sequence. It, re it really is something else. And the same descriptor could apply to this next sequence I need to bring up. It is the dining car scene in the, the big train set piece. Just I'll curse for this. Holy shit. How did you do that? I could spend an entire ladies night conversation and then some just breaking down that entire scene. So in order to get to a little piece of it right now of everything that happens in that particular scene, do you remember the single most challenging beat within it, a particular stunt move or something like that, that would often trip the two of you up? For, yeah, I mean, it never tripped Tom up because he's <laughs> of it just, he's masterful at it. Um, but there was, so you know when, without giving too much spoilers away, she's hanging, she's like on the, on the, in the vertical train that's going on its over a ravine and the piano is about to fall and he's going jump. And this follows a moment where he has, he's he's already jumped across and he's going jump and i'm just you can see I, like she's got adrenal fatigue she's she knows that if she doesn't she's going to die but she's also going to take a risk by jumping because she might not make it and it, it follows a moment where which was was improvised and tom really loved it and kept on you know asked me to, to do it again and again of when he goes do you trust me and i the first time i did it i just went yeah <laughs> and and that was all real, you know, I felt like I trusted him, but I didn't know if Grace would in this moment, like it was just, it was so much. And then take after take, having to jump across that train carriage. And it's, it's big, like it's a huge cylinder. It's this vessel, hollow vessel. And I have to jump and he catches me with one arm and holds my body weight as a piano goes rushing past us. And it was timed 
it was timed safely. So I was given a couple of like a cue where my the platform I was on kind of kind of starts to break and it would always scare me because that would go and I'd kind of lose my footing and then I'd have to jump and I'd have no choice. I couldn't decide in my own time when to do it. Like you go and you don't think about it. And that, that, that would always take my breath away. How is there not an Academy Award category for stunt work? I just can't I the life of me process that. They are extraordinary. You know, that not only are they highly skilled physically, but they're also, it's not just about fighting, it's selling the fight and the story within the fight. That's, it's more of a dance, it's balletic. I think I absolutely think they need more recognition. Those that and casting directors for exactly. sure. Exactly. <laughs> if you didn't say that, I was about to. I must let you go. I could talk about this movie all day long. Seriously, congratulations! This is one heck of a feat from you know the stunt angle, but also bringing out a layered character like you do in such a heavy action movie like this is really something special. So, congratulations on Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One and everything you've accomplished in this industry and everything that's to come for you. Thank you so much. It's been so fun chatting with you. I really have loved it.